Okay, thank you, Rudy. And let me echo um, my own welcome to our four new council members. I feel like I invited them to join council a long time ago, but that's a whole other story. I'm glad we finally are bringing them on board, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to have them uh, join this very valuable group that serves the Institute so well. So I want to welcome all of you to this open session of the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research. Um, that includes lots of people that are here in the room, but I also know lots of people that are joining us virtually and many others who will watch the recording that we always make of our open session. Um, my director's report, like the rest of the open session, is being recorded and has been organized to be part of a permanent archive on NHGRI's uh, website, uh, genome.gov. As a reminder, especially for those of you who are, who are new to our council meetings, I want to make you aware that there's an electronic resource that has been developed associated with my director's report. Um, this is a resource that is highly analogous to a supplementary material section of a published paper. Um, it can be accessed at the URL that's shown here. And the slides that I show throughout my director's report are also available on this uh, site, both in uh, PDF and PowerPoint formats. When there is a document uh, or a relevant website or something electronic associated with a slide, we put a little document number in the bottom right corner, um, and that document number references materials that can be accessed on this uh, web page. Some cases you could download or go to a web page or so forth. And this entire um, uh, infrastructure, the web page, all the link documents and so far are so forth are permanently archived on genome.gov as part of this council meeting. Now, we're going to have a busy open session. It's going to last a good part of the day. Um, and there's several other presentations that are going to take place. Um, I'm in, given these later presentations, I tried not to discuss in detail any of the topics that others are going to cover. We're going to start off after my director's report uh, with Jeannie Marazzo. Um, will be a special guest. Uh, she is the director or the new director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, otherwise known as NIAID. And she's going to give a presentation about the NIAID mission, infectious diseases, and beyond. Then we're actually going to tackle three concept clearances that are going to be presented by extramural program staff. First, uh, Lisa Chadwick will give a, a present a concept clearance on supporting talented early career researchers in genomics. Then we're going to hear from Ebony Madden, who's going to present a concept clearance on genome research experiences to attract talented undergraduates into genomic fields to enhance diversity. With its long name, it gets abbreviated GREAT. And finally, uh, Lucia Hendorf will present a concept clearance on the NHGRI Predoctoral and Postdoctoral Transition Award for a Diverse Genomics Workforce. Following the concept clearances, we're going to have three more presentations. Um, first, Lucia Hendorf will return, and she will join uh, me um, as we present the Betty J. Graham Leadership Awards for Enhancing Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility in the Genomics Workforce. Um, then Karen Mulkey and Jesse Ingritz is gonna, will talk about the impact of genomic variation on function, or our IGVF consortium. They will give an update about that. And then Jennifer Posey is actually here in person, and she's going to discuss the genomics research to elucidate the genetics of rare diseases, or Gregor Consortium, and we'll give an update about that. And then after those presentations, we have several reports to give. First, Xander Arguella and Nancy Cox are going to give a report from Advances in the Genetic Architecture of Complex Human Traits workshop that was held recently. And then Renee Ryder and Ian Nova will give us an overview of the NHGRI Small Business Program to remind everybody about that program. And then finally, we're going to have a presentation from Sarah Whelan about some upcoming revisions for fellowship applications and simplified review framework for research applications. So that's a pretty full open session agenda, but let me then just move on with my director's report. And so I'm going to cover these seven areas, which for now many years have served us well to allow me to give you a good summary of the areas we wanted to highlight. And I will start with some NHGRI uh, updates. In March, Esau Ann Lim joined NHGRI as the new deputy director of our Division of Extramural Operations. This division develops and implements extramural policy at NHGRI, including those for application referral, scientific review, grants management, and research integrity. Prior to joining NHGRI, so built and supervised the policy legislation, communications, and engagement team at the NIH Office of AIDS Research. There she oversaw operational planning, reports to Congress, and online resources covering NIH's HIV research portfolio. 
And previous to that, she led projects on strategic planning, portfolio analysis, data visualization, and program evaluation at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. She also pursued a number of short-term assignments, first as a program official working at intellectual and developmental disability policies, second in the extramural research program of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and third within the receipt and referral component of the Center for Scientific Review. And if that wasn't enough, fourth, she also was in the Office of Extramural Research working on implementing rigor and reproducibility policy. In March, uh, Chris Wetterstrand, been at the Institute a long time, but has now taken on new roles at NHGRI, returning to the extramural research program as a program operations lead within the Division of Extramural Operations. There, Chris will foster the development and implementation of extramural policy, especially in the areas of program operations and data release. She is also a program director in the Division of Genome Sciences, where she will manage the Comparative Genomics Grant Portfolio. Prior to this, Chris worked for me in the Office of the Director for 13 years, and some of her notable accomplishments in that role included um, major responsibilities in, for two strategic planning efforts, content development for the exhibition Genome on Lofkin Life's Code, serving as the lead editor of my monthly newsletter, The Genomics Landscape, and helping to start the NHGRI History of Genomics program. In April, Nephi Walton joined NHGRI as a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine. He brings expertise in clinical informatics as it relates to genomic medicine. And prior to joining NHGRI, he was the Associate Medical Director of Intermountain Precision Genomics at Intermountain Healthcare. After receiving his MD from the University of Utah, Nephi trained in pediatrics and genetics. And he now has over 20 years of experience in medical genetics, biomedical informatics, machine learning, and precision medicine and has been involved in efforts at two of the largest population genome sequencing programs in the United States. In March, Jean Gao joined NHGRI as a program director in the Office of Genomic Data Science. Prior to joining NHGRI, she was a program director for four years in the Division of Biological Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation, serving as the lead program director managing grant portfolios related to bioinformatics and computational biology. She also co-initiated and managed several new foundation-wide programs, including the Mid-Career Advancement Program, the Dark Dimensions for the RNA Regulome Ideas Lab, and the Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems Program. Jean was previously professor of computer science and engineering in the department, um, and that department at the University of Texas at Arlington for 22 years. Her research focused on developing efficient algorithms to solve large-scale data analysis problems in basic medicine and in clinical settings, while making theoretical and fundamental contributions to machine learning, data mining, statistical pattern recognition, and computer vision. Now, as you may recall, Last fall, I announced the new ASHG, NHGRI Genomics and Public Service Fellowship Program, which is an expansion of the joint fellowship that the American Society of Human Genetics, or ASHG, and NHGRI have had for many years. Today, both ASHG and NHGRI are very excited to formally announce the inaugural class of this new expanded fellowship program. And in fact, 48 minutes ago, ASHG posted on their website uh, a press release about these individuals. And let me tell you about them, and you'll eventually meet them. There are 10 new fellows who will begin this July, which is why you're not meeting them today. The new graduate level fellows are Cameron Washington as our genetics, and ed ed genetics education and engagement fellow, Elizabeth Roy as our genetics and public policy fellow, and Jacqueline Cohn as our genomics communications fellow. There will also be seven post-baccalaureate genomic analyst fellows. The two shown here will be based at the ASHG office, Maya Montgomery and Allison Wilcox. And then there will be five post-baccalaureate genomics analyst fellows shown here, and those will be based at NHGRI within our extramural research program. Malia Jennings, Mike Lopez, Sophia Martin, Jessica Reinick, and Gabrielle Villard. Those of us at both ASHG and NHGRI are very excited to have this first group of 10 fellows arrive on July 1, and we have many, many things planned to ensure a very positive experience during their two-year fellowship with us. 
So with that, let me move on to some NIH updates. Kathleen Newsell was recently appointed as the 13th director of NIH's Fogarty International Center and the NIH Associate Director for International Research. She is the first woman to hold this directorship since the center's founding in 1968. She brings decades of global health experience with an impressive portfolio that includes clinical and epidemiological studies. Her many years as a vaccine policy advisor to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization makes her well-suited to lead the Fogarty International Center. Sean Mooney is now in place as the director of NIH's Center for Information Technology. I will point out that in addition to this leadership role, um, Sean will also head a research program hosted by NHGRI's Intramural Research Program, specifically within the new Center for Genomics and Data Science Research. On May 1st, NIH officially launched the search for a new director of the National Library of Medicine, or NLM. NLM aims to be the NIH epicenter of information and data science, and is home to databases like PubMed and clinicaltrials.gov. This is a truly unique opportunity for an exceptional leader to provide the executive direction and scientific leadership that will continue pushing NLM forward to become a world-class hub for research analytics and training in health-related data science. It turns out that I'm actually co-chairing the search committee along with Nora Valko, who's the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and we are very eager to get suggestions of candidates to contact. Applications are due July 1, so there's still lots of time. And anybody with any ideas of people we should contact, feel free to email me directly with those names, and I will contact those individuals. There are uh, going to be some departures, uh, one in particular. Josh Gordon recently announced that he will soon be departing from his role as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, or NIMH to return to Columbia University. I suspect one of our new council members might have had something to do with that, but I'm not going to name names, Katrina. Um, <laughs> but congratulations to you. Um, during his time as NIMH director, Josh has overseen a major growth in NIMH's uh, basic translational and clinical research that aims to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illnesses. Now, following um, Josh's departure, um, and while a search for a new director is conducted, uh, Shelley Avenoli, will, uh, who's currently serving as the NIMH's deputy director, will serve as the acting NIMH director. In March, President Biden signed a new executive order to build upon the establishment of the White House Initiative on Women's Health Research. The executive order prioritizes investments in women's health research, integrating women's health across multiple federal um, research uh, efforts and galvanizing new research on women's midlife health and assessing the unmet needs to support women's health research. And then in April, uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, posted a finalized rule to regulate laboratory-developed tests, or LDTs. Now, the proposed rule changes the definition of medical devices to include LDTs, subjecting them to the same oversight as other diagnostic products manufactured by industry. The rule includes a four-year phase-out of general enforcement discretion and implementation of targeted enforcement discretion of certain LDTs, meaning they would not need to undergo pre-market and quality system review. It is important to note that some tests will be considered legacies and will not need to undergo the full FDA regulatory process. This includes LDTs offered prior to May 6th of 2024 with no further modifications, such as updates for improved genomic variant calling and LDTs manufactured and performed by a lab integrated in a healthcare system when an FDA authorized test is not available. Needless to say, this is a lot of complicated twists and turns, but uh, we are tracking this uh, carefully within the Institute. We thought you'd be interested to be aware that in March, the United for Medical Research released a report entitled NIH's Role in Sustaining the U.S. Economy. The report noted a substantial return on investment from NIH research. Specifically, they calculated that every dollar invested in NIH produces approximately $2.46 of economic activity within the United States, with the economic benefits actually helping every state in the country. 
The report also demonstrated NIH's role as a catalyst for innovation and economic growth and noted the negative impacts on U.S. leadership in biomedical research and innovation that would result from a failure to robustly fund biomedical research. Uh, so in light of this report, now would be a good time to pivot to the current budget situation for NIH. Well, following six months of operating under a continuing resolution, a federal budget for fiscal year 2024 was enacted in March, providing about $47 billion to NIH and $663 million to NHGRI. Not accounting for inflation and excluding ARPA-H, the budget provides a top-line 0.8% cut from the federal year 2023 enacted level for NIH and a technically flat budget for NHGRI. So that's where we are this fiscal year. But meanwhile, the Biden administration also released the fiscal year 2025 president's budget, which is meant to lay out the Biden administration's priorities for the next fiscal year. The fiscal year 2025 president's budget includes $50.1 billion for NIH and $664 million for NHGRI. Now, for comparison, also shown is the fiscal year 2024 enacted budget, and this was $1.4 billion less than what was originally proposed by the president for fiscal year 2024. So essentially, this ends up being a proposed flat budget for NHGRI and a proposed 3% overall cut for NIH. And again, this is the president's budget, which is just the first step in a very long process that will lead eventually to a fiscal year 2025 appropriation. Okay, moving on to some general genomics updates, starting, starting on a sad note. A good friend and relative of NHGRI, Gary Felsenfeld, uh, passed away earlier this month. Gary was a highly accomplished researcher who made major contributions to our understanding the relationship between chromatin structure and gene expression. Before retiring, he was for many years a section chief in the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. He truly enjoyed working at NIH, which provided him the opportunity to work in the lab every day, uh, train postdoctoral fellows, and remain constantly invested in science. After retirement, he enjoyed photography and spending time with his family, including NHGRI program director Adam Felsenfeld. Richard Cooper passed away in April. Richard was known for his extensive contributions in the study of hypertension and other cardiac diseases in individuals of African ancestry. Before retiring, Richard served as chair of the Department of Public Health Sciences at Loyola University Chicago's Stritch School of Medicine. He received an NIH Merit Award for his research of the African diaspora and actually previously served on this advisory council from 2008 to 2011. In other news relevant to NHGRI and genomics, Amanda Pearl has been appointed the new Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Human Genetics. In this role, Amanda will oversee the day-to-day -day operations of ASHG and help to execute the updated strategic plan to meet the organization's vision of providing the best member value, service, professionalism, innovation, and advocacy for the genetics and genomics community. With her expertise in issues that are affecting member-based organizations, experience in association management, and previous leadership role as the executive director of the American Thyroid Association, Amanda is well poised to take the helm of ASHG, and we look forward to working with her. In February, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASM, released their highly anticipated report entitled Charting a Future for Sequencing RNA and Its Modifications. This report details the findings from a two-year consensus study and was sponsored by the Warren Alpert Foundation, also the Envi National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and also NHGRI. The report focuses on technology and infrastructure that's needed for the direct end-to-end -end sequencing of RNA and the chemical modifications of RNA bases, referred to as the epitranscriptome. The, port, the report reviews the current known impacts of RNA base modifications on biology and health and biotechnology. It also highlights critical gaps in the existing RNA sequencing technologies. Looking towards the future, the report provides recommendations for standards, technologies, and also a regulatory agency tasks, while also setting out five, 10, and 15-year priorities and milestones to achieve those goals.
The National Academy of Sciences recently announced their newly elected members, and I, of particular relevance to NHGRI and the genomics community are the people uh, listed here. And congratulations uh, to these friends and colleagues of the Institute and to the genomics community. Moving on then to the extramural research program of the Institute. So in August of 2022, NHGRI launched the Molecular Phenotypes of Null Alleles in Cells, otherwise known as our Morphic Consortium, which aims to develop an extensive catalog of molecular and cellular phenotypes for null alleles of every human gene. The program is still in its first phase, uh, laying the foundation for the program and generating early data. Now, Morphic had its first full consortium meeting this past February. And the two-day meeting highlighted experimental design, data pipelines, individual scientific results, and progress updates. The program also included a hackathon led by early career investigators from the consortium's data analysis centers. And these hackathon participants explored multiple analysis approaches using initial data sets generated by the Morphic Consortium. I can also tell you the external scientific consultants panel attended the meeting and also provided NHGRI um, some valuable uh, feedback. Then in April, NHGRI hosted a strategic planning meeting on identifying research priorities to accelerate genetic diagnoses. The presentations and discussions focused on major challenges, gaps, and opportunities to advance understanding of the genetic causes of Mendelian conditions and to increase the rate of identifying the genetic causes of rare genetic diseases. Topic areas included emerging technologies, data sharing, linking genomic variants to function, and computational tools. And the workshop hosted about 25 in-person participants in addition to remote viewers. And the workshop's recording and report will be available soon on genome.gov. From February to April, NHGRI sought to get input from the scientific community about future research directions towards understanding the effects of genomic variants on genome function. External scientists with a range of scientific backgrounds provided written feedback and participated in virtual panel discussions on the following topics. It included testing and assessing the function of individual genomic variants, testing genomic variants in, um, in context to assess function, the needs for technology development, predictive modeling, and resource building. The community feedback will now be used to identify gaps, opportunities, and challenges for which NHGRI can support research, both in the short term to improve our understanding of how genomic variants affect traits and diseases, but also in the long term to apply these scientific discoveries in medicine. And a written report of the feedback received during community input um, was actually just posted, like very recently just posted on genome.gov. Last year, NHGRI launched the Educational Hub for Enhancing Diversity in Computational Genomics and Data Science. Sometimes we refer to it as the hub for short. Now, the hub will leverage cloud platforms, increasing access to educational research opportunities in computational genomics and data science. Efforts will be geared towards undergraduate and master's degree students enrolled at institutions serving students from diverse backgrounds, including those that have been historically underrepresented in genomics research. NHGRI is soliciting applications from faculty members at the hub's partner sites to develop educational content that uses cloud computing resources. And together, the hub and the partner sites will create a community of institutions working collectively to broaden the future workforce for computational genomics and data science. And applications for funding opportunity for the partner sites are due on June 10th. The NHGRI Analysis, Visualization, and Informatics Lab Space, or ANVIL, is a secure cloud-based platform where researchers can store Combine, share, and analyze unrestricted and controlled access data sets, particularly those generated with NHGRI funding or support. Now, although cloud computing presents opportunities for analyzing large data sets, it is often difficult to analyze data across different platforms. The NIH Cloud Platform Interoperability Program, or NCPI, was created to address this challenge by fostering interoperability between NIH-supported cloud platforms in an effort to create a truly trans-NIH, cloud-based, federated data ecosystem. With funding, support from the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy, and ANVIL is collaborating with NCPI on four different projects, NHLBI's BioData Catalyst, 
NCI's Cancer Research Data Commons, NCBI's dbGaP, and the Common Fund's Gabriella Miller Kids First Pediatric Research Program. So these projects are seeking to enable the integration of data across NIH-funded platforms with scientific driver projects. By better connecting NIH's cloud-based platforms, these projects aim to expand research potential by maximizing the value of NIH-supported data sets. The Clinical Genome Resource, or ClinGen, evaluates and disseminates the clinical relevance of genes and genomic variants for use in precision medicine and research. ClinGen is actually celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And for this anniversary, they held celebratory events at the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics meeting, and more recently at curating the clinical genome meeting. The celebrations were an opportunity to acknowledge ClinGen's decade of remarkable progress, but also to thank the nearly 2,500 ClinGen contributors for their dedication to ClinGen's curation efforts. And in March, Phoenix published a paper outlining the process of selecting and implementing social determinants of health measurement protocols in the Phoenix Toolkit. In 2022, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities provided funding to broaden the Phoenix's Social Determinants of Health collection and convened a second expert working group to address new topic areas. This effort resulted in 15 new protocols being added to the Social Determinants of Health collections, covering both individual level and structural level social determinants of health. Examples of new individual level measures include discrimination in healthcare and internet access. New structural level measurements, which are at the societal or community level, include water access, sanitation, and minimum wage. Um, these protocols um, uh, are provide a valuable resource for researchers hoping to appropriately measure social determinants of health in their studies and to better understand the impact of social determinants of health on biological and behavioral mechanisms, phenotypes, and exposures. Ultimately, as more researchers incorporate social determinants of health and use these standard protocols, it'll be more straightforward to replicate studies and promote collaborative research through data sharing and cross-study analyses. And towards that end, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities actually created a short YouTube video that provides additional information on the Phoenix Social Determinants of Health collection. In April, NHGRI convened a workshop aimed at defining the optimal clinical data ecosystem for genomic health. The transformative potential of genomics and healthcare is immense, but there are significant challenges to enabling the longitudinal use of genome sequencing in clinical care. Our healthcare infrastructure currently falls short of supporting the promise of precision medicine. Genomic data, which is crucial for personalized medicine, remains confined within laboratory walls and is largely inaccessible for direct clinical application. And so this workshop was dedicated to identifying ways to overcome these barriers. The objectives of the workshop were to define a data ecosystem outlining paths of genomic data from laboratory to electronic health records to each patient clinician and across health systems. Also to determine informatic standards to be adopted, the systems that needed to be built, and policies that need to be developed. And finally, to identify research directions for optimizing genomic data integration and utilization in delivery of healthcare. And the workshop recording and summary will be made available on genome.gov. The Ethical, Legal, and Social Applications, or LC Research Program, supports research that anticipates, explores, and addresses implications for genetics and genomics for individuals, families, and communities. And the sixth LC Congress will be held June 10th through 12th in New York City, featuring both in-person and virtual components. The theme for the 2024 Congress is reimagining the benefits of genomic science. LCCon invites researchers, practitioners, trainees, and other scholars to share their latest LC research, and registration for the event is now open. NHGRI intends to release a new funding opportunity entitled Building Partnerships and Broadening Perspectives to advance ethical, legal, and social implications research, or BBAER, pronounced BEAR, 
The BEAR program has four goals. First, to support transdisciplinary community experts as team members. Um, second, to enhance LC research teams by including community experts. Third, to build capacity for LC research within organizations that do not have traditionally funded, have not been traditionally funded by NHGRI. And fourth, to expand the LC research workforce. Eligible applicants include domestic organizations in the United States receiving less than $30 million per year in total NIH funding in the last three years. And a notice of intent to publish was released in March to allow potential applicants sufficient times to develop meaningful collaborations and responsive projects. And NHGRI is planning to disseminate um, further information through other avenues to increase awareness of this opportunity. The NHGRI training program aims to prepare a talented and diverse genomic workforce by providing both institutional and individual level funding through a variety of mechanisms, including individual fellowship and career development awards, institutional training awards, and diversity supplements. The programs are offered at the undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, graduate, postdoctoral, and faculty levels. The ninth annual research training and career development meeting was held in Seattle in April and was hosted by Duke University. The meeting brought uh, together over 400 in-person attendees, and the trainees presented posters, gave lightning talks, and attended scientific lectures presented by their peers. Other highlights um, included a keynote talk by Wiley Burke, a plenary panel discussion with some outstanding local genomic talent that I convened, and also networking lunches with PIs and NHGRI staff. In 2022, NHGRI worked with others at NIH to convene a workshop entitled Future Directions in Genomics and Health Equity, a meeting that examined health equity within the context of human genomics. A paper reporting the recommendations to that workshop was recently published in Nature Genetics. The paper also provides an informative literature review and discusses the importance of developing metrics to establish progress in health equity, policy development, equitable participation, establishing partnerships, and improving workforce diversity. In 2023, multiple NIH institute centers and offices sponsored a National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine study to review and assess existing methodologies, benefits, and challenges in using population descriptors in genomics research. This culminated in the report entitled Using Population Descriptors in Genetics and Genomics Research, a New Framework for an Evolving Field. Well, to further explore this report with regards to legacy genomic data, NHGRI is partnering with other NIH institutes and centers to host a two-day virtual workshop on May 28th and 29th. This workshop will convene leaders of genomic data science resources, resources researchers who use legacy data, and other partners to make recommendations regarding the application of population descriptors to existing data. The workshop objectives are to summarize current approaches to the use of population descriptors in and for legacy data, define and address challenges with harmonization, interoperability, and analysis, develop recommendations that will be widely adopted, and identify opportunities for future research and collaboration. All are encouraged to register and participate in this event, if so um, interested in doing so. Let me now just uh, briefly highlight two recent publications supported by NHGRI's extramural investigator-initiated research portfolio. Uh, this publication from Yang and colleagues provides insights into the genetic basis of differences in blood pressure traits between males and females. They identified several sex-specific genetic loci enriched for hormone-related transcription factors, as well as regions showing female-specific association with blood pressure and pulse pressure. And then this publication from Riggin and colleagues describes the experiences of self-identified black and Hispanic women in Florida's new program that offers prenatal cell-free DNA screening to patients receiving state health insurance. Although the researchers noticed interest in the screening by patients, the patients reported a lack of pre-screening counseling, as well as a limited understanding of the benefits of such prenatal uh, genetic screening. Moving on then to the NIH Common Fund and other trans-NIH efforts. We'll start with the Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project, or COMP2, which is a trans-NIH research program focusing on generating a comprehensive resource of null mutant mice 
and their phenotype, phenotype information. COMP2 is a founding member of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, or IMPC, that comprises 21 centers in 15 countries. To date, COMP2 investigators have developed and phenotyped around 5,500 strains of knockout mice, contributing to the more than 10,000 strains created by the IMPC. The impact of the resources demonstrated by a growing body of publications using COMP2 and, and IMPC resources. Averaging nearly 700 articles per year over the last decade, there are now over 7,000 publications that can be explored on the resource webpage. The International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium Spring Meeting was held in April with an overarching theme of exploration beyond the genome, meeting topics focused on advances in understanding non-coding sequences, epigenetic influences, and disease therapies. And an IMPC virtual workshop will occur, occur later this month, which will introduce attendees to methods for extracting data from the IMPC resource. Another, a common fund program is the Bridge to Artificial Intelligence, or Bridge to AI. Um, and Bridge to AI will set the stage for widespread use of artificial intelligence um, in healthcare research. The goals of the program are to generate hypothesis agnostic AI ready data sets, create ethical AI best practices, and to train a future biomedical AI workforce. Bridge to AI's grand challenges include AI analyses of human voice recordings as a biomarker for health, analyses of ICU data to build predictive models for adverse health events, the creation of functional genomic maps of human cells for interpretable genotype phenotype learning, and using type 2 diabetes as a model to show how a person's health um, is restored after disease. I serve as one of the co-chairs of the program, and NHGRI is playing a prominent role in its oversight, including administering awards for the program's Bridge Center, which will integrate and disseminate the data, knowledge, and practices from across the program. One of the goals of Bridge to AI is to share AI-ready data sets as quickly as possible with the broader scientific community. The program had their first ever open house last month. This event was significant because data sets from the Grand Challenges were made available for use. The event also featured hands-on collaborative sessions to evaluate the utility of these resources for scientists in the wider community. Moving on to the All of Us Research Program. And All of Us is seeking to build a national research cohort of over one million or more participants reflecting the diversity of the United States. The program is creating a partnership with participants in order to advance precision medicine and to change healthcare to the benefit of all. This past February, the program published several papers in the Nature portfolio of journals. In this flagship publication, the All of Us Research Program investigators described the generation and release of nearly a quarter of a million genome sequences, 77% of which are from historically underrepresented communities in the United States. The accompanying analysis revealed identification of nearly 275 million previously unreported genomic variants. These data can be accessed through the All of Us Researcher Workbench. This paper received significant attention within the scientific community, sparking important conversations on the presentation of genetic ancestry data alongside social identity labels and the proper use of visual data, visual, data visualization techniques. Additionally, recently published papers describe the integration of multi-ancestry GWAS data with single-cell epigenomics to identify genetic drivers of heterogeneity in patients with type 2 diabetes, and disparities in the frequency of pathogenic genomic variants across ancestry groups in the All of Us cohort, and the use of All of Us data to optimize polygenic risk scores for diverse populations. Now, the last publication I would note represents a collaborative effort between NHGRI's Emerge Consortium and the All of Us Research Program. However, all is not good news for the All of Us Research Program. For complicated reasons, the program received a significant funding cut in their fiscal year 2024 appropriation. This graph shows the funding level for all of us each year, with blue representing funds from its base allocation and orange representing funds from the 21st Century Cures Act. All of us funding was at $541 million in fiscal year 2023. But due to the drop in Cures Act funds, the program is only receiving 
$357 million in fiscal year 2024, representing an, immediately, an immediate overall decrease of $184 million, or in other words, a 34% reduction. Looking forward, there could be even more significant reductions in the Cures Act funds in fiscal years 25 and 26, after which that funding stream is set to expire, unless something is done to fix the downward trajectory. However, the President's fiscal year 2025 budget, uh, which is shown on the far right, proposes an increase in non-Cures Act funds depicted by the purple bar. However, this restoration of funding is not guaranteed. It was just put in the President's budget as a first step. Now, uh, last month, Josh Denny, the All of Us CEO, provided an update about these funding uncertainties. Um, there will be reductions to most program awards this year with a resulting decrease in enrollment rates, a delay in launching pediatric enrollment, and a slowing of new data generation. However, the program will continue to build on its accomplishments to date, which includes having over 790,000 participants enrolled, having over 10,000 researchers signed up for data access, and having hundreds of papers already published using all of us data. The Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, or BGTC, brings together partners from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to foster development of gene therapies intended to treat rare genetic diseases, which affect populations too small for viable commercial development. BGTC aims to advance the understanding of basic adeno-associated virus, or AAV, life cycle biology to help optimize vector generation and delivery and to standardize and streamline regulatory requirements for approval of gene therapies. Last summer, BGTC finalized the selection of eight rare diseases for its clinical trial portfolio, and those are listed here. One of the clinical trials is actually led by NHGRI's intramural investigator, Chuck Venditti. BGDC also recently published its first paper, a commentary in Nature Review's Drug Discovery, which provides a high-level overview of BGTC's objectives. And lastly, the first version of the BGTC regulatory playbook is now online and contains a wealth of useful information. Now, this playbook was created as a one-stop shop guide for clinical and drug development researchers who are working to bring AAV gene therapies to rare disease patients. It addresses the critical steps before submission of investigational new drug applications for the first human studies and includes overviews of regulatory best practices as well as case studies of existing AAV gene therapies. Now, the US populations that are disproportionately affected by illness are, are traditionally underrepresented in research and often medically underserved. To help address this, NIH is developing a new program to expand research to where people seek care, integrating clinical research into primary care settings. Now, I will stress, this is a priority of the new NIH director, and because that NIH plans to establish a clinical research network focused on primary care across the mission areas of all institutes and centers, but one that is also disease agnostic. The program will integrate innovative research with routine clinical care in real-world settings. It will also create a foundation for sustained engagement with communities often underrepresented in clinical research. For this program, the NIH Common Fund will contribute $5 million in fiscal year 2024 and $25 million in fiscal year 2025, and then assess feasibility and additional budget requirements. In fiscal years 26 and 27, the program hopes to receive additional support from the NIH institutes and centers to ramp up to a total of 50 to $100 million. The NIH Office of the Director is currently gathering community feedback on how best to build the network through listening sessions and a public workshop. NIH anticipates a quick launch this fiscal year to expand existing studies to increase engagement and then expand the program further next year and beyond. And now let's move on to NHGRI communications, uh, policy, and education. So for this council meeting's archival spotlight from NHGRI's History of Genomics program, we're actually announcing a new feature, something called virtual exhibits that are now going to be posted on genome.gov. 
Now, utilizing specifically curated and summarized materials from NHGRI's extensive historical archive, these virtual exhibits will tell complex and impactful stories from the larger history of NHGRI and genomics in a fashion that is geared towards a general audience. Now, this first exhibit, um, which just got posted like last week, is entitled The Human Genome Project is Simply a Bad Idea, which tells the story of a 1990 letter writing campaign to stop funding of the yet to begin Human Genome Project. The exhibit contains a curated collection of letters sent to then acting NIH Director William Robb in early 1990, which lay out a variety of arguments against the Human Genome Project. The nearly 50 letters were actually kept by Elka Jordan, the deputy director of the National Center for Human Genome Research at the time. And by reviewing the materials in this easy to access exhibit, one can now learn about the nuanced arguments opposing the Human Genome Project. And we hope that this exhibit will provide a meaningful historical context for how a project of this size and scope of the Human Genome Project really did present legitimate concerns for some researchers at the time. Now, the other aspect of it is I was tickled by this, when I first started reading about this exhibit, it just brought back a flood of memories, at least for me in particular. And so since this is actually a shorter director's report, I thought I would share with you a presentation, I actually, a part of a presentation, just part of it, that I put together that some of you who are at the training meeting actually saw. But for those who are not familiar with this letter writing campaign, there is a, there is, it is interesting to learn a little bit more, and since we have a little bit of extra time, I thought I would do it. So this is really just serving as a teaser for you to actually go in and look at this exhibit to learn more. And so um, the context of this was that there was this drumbeat of opposition to the Human Genome Project that started really um, at the beginning of the planning phases, which started about 1987, 1988, 1989, um, but then really reached its peak in early 1990 before the launch of the project. And so for example, in June, now remember the project launched in October, in June, um, this piece in the New York Times talked about the opposition to the Human Genome Project, and in it was a quote from this gentleman, uh, Martin Rushdiner from the University of Utah, which we don't hold against Lynn Jordy, our council member, but, uh, but Martin said, the Human Genome Project is bad science. It's unthought out science. It's hype science, said Dr. Martin Rushdiner, et cetera. Some critics began aggressive writing, writer, letter writing campaigns urging colleagues who harbored similar sentiments to write Congress. And this was a serious letter writing campaign. And in particular, Martin Rushdiner had indeed started a campaign with this seven page letter in early 1990. And he specifically said in the letter, if you agree with the arguments presented in his letter, he urged everybody to write the science advisor to the president, Alan Bromley, the NIH acting director, William Robb, Senator Gore, that was Al Gore, Senator Kennedy, that was Ted Kennedy, and expressed your reservations, concerns, or opposition to the Human Genome Project. And in short, he said, it's a waste of national resources as detriment of the training of young scientists, and I urge you to take time to voice your opposition. And he said 5,000 letters would have a significant impact. He got 55 letters, but they were interesting letters. And these letters were actually taken very seriously, I can tell you. Um, there are pages and pages of responses um, to each and every letter. Shown here are representative examples. The letter on the left is one representative uh, response. You can see multiple pages by Elka Jordan. And the one on the right um, was by, uh, written by James Weingartner, who was at that time in the Office of Science and Technology Policy within the White House. And so these got a lot of, uh, you know, serious attention by high-level people. But some of you, especially uh, younger people, might say, wait, you know, how could anyone really object to the Human Genome Project, right? I mean, it's genomics. The Human Genome Project, it's like flowers and sunshine and puppies. What could there possibly be the objection? Well, to be fair, and I remember, and I'm looking around the table, some of you remember, I mean, some of the criticisms were somewhat reasonable. Um, you know, there was diversion or concerns about diverting research funds away from small laboratories. You know, there was concerns about implementing a big science biology project to disrupt biology. There were uncertainties about the readiness of the genomic technologies. Were we really ready to hit the accelerator? And then there was the, whether it was appropriate for young researchers and trainees. Back, back then I was a young research, I was a young trainee. Whether it was an appropriate place for them to be working. And, and many of us remembered uh, these things. And there was also the concern that it just wouldn't work, that the project would fail. So those are the reasonable criticisms. But the fun part of looking through these letters is that um, other criticisms were surprising. Some were egregious. 
Some were snarky. Uh, some were insensitive. Some were just outright rude. Um, but, you know, just some of them were just plain entertaining. They were just funny. And um, so just for fun, I just want to show you excerpts of five additional letters to illustrate somewhat reasonable arguments, but what I think are now humorous objections to the Human Genome Project at the time. So here's an example of a, one of the letters came in from a scientist at the University of Connecticut. And the criticism was that major discoveries do not come from such directions. The acquisition of information is not knowledge. The Human Genome Project is a bit like collecting license plate numbers in a shopping mall, only much more labor intensive. Now, I have to admit, I didn't even understand that argument, but maybe I'm not a, into license plates. So I went to Google. I said, Google, uh, I, I just put in license plate, genomics, and image. And weirdly, I actually got a license plate from Connecticut of all places. So there's something going on in Connecticut with license plates. I just, I had no idea that sitting in the audience was the person who has that license plate, who's actually a former member of this council. And it was Brent Gravely. And, and before I even sat down, Carolyn Hutter, who already had a photo with Brent and the car and the license plate, it was already waiting in my inbox. So this is, this is just crazy, right? OK, but OK, so that, that was one example. Another example. Um, this is somebody, a letter written by uh, someone from University of Washington. So I'd have to make fun of Gal Jarvik, but she's missing this council meeting. Where they, they said, I suspect that many bright young people will not even consider a career in this area. Yeah, some of us did, but okay, whatever. And they went on to say that I would suggest you try to get the Japanese to take on this wasteful project, although I suspect they will again be too smart to do it as the information must be freely shared to be useful, there will be no benefit to the country that performs the task. I mean, that's a really weird geopolitical scientific twist. That's, that's not even very nice. It's a little bit rude. So, okay, all right, so that's another weird one. But then there were themes around just the, the word stupidity comes up. So this letter from somebody at the University of Minnesota so the HGP is costly, wasteful, and inappropriate allocation of research funds. The HGP will provide little useful training and no intellectual stimulation to young scientists. Okay. And then when I just say, finally, 90%, 5% do not code for poaching as thought by many, including Africa, to be junk. Okay. All right. So there, there you go. Now we're dealing with this, that, that, that four-letter word, junk, that came up repeatedly. And so, and indeed, it came up um, yet again with this, I hate to say it, by the way, this is from a letter from the University of Wisconsin, so here I even feel bad as that's my alma mater. I am certain that most of the sequence information is generated will never prove to be of any scientific value, especially since greater than 90% of the sequence are non-coding or junk DNA sequences. Um, and so, you know, we just sort of have to recognize that that was the view back then, it was just one big junkyard. Um, but, you know, one person's junk is another person's treasure, and uh, we have learned how to make out of that junk a lot of really cool stuff. And um, needless to say, uh, we just forged ahead, although this person knew one, so here's where the stupid part comes in. The Human Genome Project is a brute force and indeed stupid way to determine those sequences that will be of biological interest. Um, you, know, I, I, it is, you know, as Forrest Gump would say, you know, stupid is what stupid does, this came up again in a very rude and snarky way in another letter, this time from Oregon Health Sciences University, where they said the information will not lead to a solution of any problem. The information, though interesting, in many cases will be superfluous, large segments of DNA or spacers, et cetera, and there'll be no urgent need to determine the sequences of these areas. Much of the work to be done could be classified as idiot work, uh, repetitive without being challenging, very snarky. Uh, which is why we developed things like the Complete Idiot's Guide to Decoding Your Genes and created a band called Idiot Genes. But that's all that comes out of these uh, snarky comments. So, in any case, uh, those are the more humorous letters, but I, I, I urge you to look at some of these other letters as uh, well that I think are quite interesting. I will move on. Um, so, Beth Shapiro is a leading expert in ancient DNA and de-extinction, and in addition to being a MacArthur Fellowship recipient in 2009, um, Beth was recently appointed the chief scientific officer at the company Colossal Biosciences, which aims to bring back the woolly mammoth and other animals from extinction. Well, recently, NHGRI's History of Genomics program uh, conducted an oral history with Beth, which is now available to watch on NHGRI's YouTube channel, uh, genome.gov, and I urge you to take a look at that. In the meanwhile, uh, later this summer, on July 17th and 18th, 
the NHGRI History of Genomics Program, the NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Office, and the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, will host a two-day virtual symposium entitled Exploring the Many Dimensions of Sex and Gender in the Genomics Era. This is an event that aims to clarify the complexity of sex and gender in light of social and genomic advances and their histories. This symposium will bring together experts from the biological and social sciences to clarify, contextualize, although not resolve, the complexities about sex, gender, and genomics by considering them in their scientific, ethical, and historical context. These interdisciplinary conversations will aid scientists, policymakers, and the public in understanding the many dimensions of sex and sex categories and their relationship with gender. The symposium aims to facilitate rigorous discussions about the many dimensions of sex and gender, how to consider these distinct constructs in genetics, genomics, and medicine, and how these insights can translate more broadly into research practices and clinical care in the genomics era. April 25th is National DNA Day, and each year NHGRI hosts several programs and offers educational resources to mark the occasion. Over the course of the past three months, actually, and in celebration of DNA Day, NHGRI's Education and Community Involvement Branch led hands-on activities engaging with over 1,000 middle, high school, and community college students across Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. National DNA Day was also celebrated on the NIH campus on April 26th with the annual Louise P. M. Slaughter National DNA Day Lecture, named after Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, who was a champion of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. This year's lecture was given by Joe Palka, science communicator and former national public radio correspondent. He shared his views on genomics and public health literacy, and nearly 300 people tuned in to view the live stream and 50 people joined in person. Another really interesting component of National DNA Day um, involved uh, NHGRI intramural researcher or intramural investigator and director of the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development, Diana Bianchi. And Diana welcomed a special guest to the NIH campus, artist Mary Ellen Sherl, to unveil a genomics relevant sculpture that she donated to the NIH. The sculpture is called The Ladder and blends biblical imagery and modern science, draws parallels between Jacob's ladders and the double helical structure of DNA. And the sculpture is now located immediately in front of the NIH Clinical Center. The dedication event featured remarks from the NIH director, Monica Bertinoli, NIH Clinical Center CEO, James Gilman, Diana Bianchi, and myself. And in addition, Mary Ellen spoke about her personal connections with genetics specifically how she, as an adoptee, used modern tools of genetics to find her biological family. The Interside Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics, or ISCC PEG, held its 13th annual meeting in April. The committee aims to improve genomic literacy of healthcare providers and enhance the effective practice of clinical genomic medicine by facilitating interactions among key stakeholders in genomics education. Highlights of the meeting include hearing presentations by the third class of ISCC PEG scholars about their ongoing genetics education projects, also a keynote talk by Terry Manolio, and formation of eight subgroups that work to design strategies to integrate genomic literacy into clinical practice. And finally, let me just say a few things about the NHGRI intramural program, starting with several awards. Um, uh, intramural branch chief Elaine Ostrander is the recipient of this year's Genetic Society of America Edward, Ed, Edward Nowitzki Prize. This award recognizes creativity and intellectual ingenuity in the solution of problems in genetics research. Elaine is recognized for her work on using the domestic dog to study fundamental biological problems and to identify genomic variants relevant to human health and disease. Her dedication to creative methods for understanding canine genetics and translating research organisms um, to humans is extensive and impressive. Former NHGRI Scientific Director Dan Kastner is the recipient of the 2024 George M. Kober Medal from the Association of American Physicians. This award is one of the most prestigious honors given to a physician scientist in the United States, recognizing outstanding leaders in medicine who make significant contributions through their scientific discoveries and mentorship. Dan has been using genetics and genomic tools to study rare inflammatory disorders for nearly four decades. He and his research group have evaluated over 2,000 patients with recurrent fever syndrome and other autoinflammatory disorders. 
Charles Rotimi, our NHGRI Scientific Director, will be honored as a recipient of one of the 2023 Arthur S. Fleming Awards, awardees. This year, the award is going to be given to 12 public servants from federal agencies, recognizing them for performing outstanding service in the fields of applied science, basic science, leadership and management, social science, clinical trials, and translational research. The winners of this award serve as outstanding role models for our public administration and public policy staff, in addition to all aspiring public servants. The award recognizes Charles for his vision in engaging US and global communities in genomics and genomic medicine. In March, the Washingtonian Magazine featured an article highlighting the Trans-NIH Undiagnosed Diseases Program, or UDP, which is part of the broader Undiagnosed Diseases Network. The UDP has always been led by Bill Gall, shown on the right, and focuses on individuals whose conditions have eluded medical diagnoses. Patients selected for the UDP undergo diagnostic tests and expert consultations by a multidisciplinary medical team at the NIH Clinical Center. Bill's team specializes in genetic conditions and uses state-of-the-art genomic techniques to offer patients the hope of a diagnosis and possibility of therapeutic interventions. And Lastly, let me just give you a few um, highlights um, since the last council meeting of papers coming out of our intramural research program. Um, Irene Manoli and Charles, Van Charles Venditti's group recently discovered a distinct phenotype of abnormal fat distribution of individuals with the rare metabolic disorder, methylmalonic acidemia, or MMA. The study further examined adipose tissue physiology in a mouse model of MMA and found that treatment of these mice with lipid-lowering drug can improve survival, reverse brown fat mitochondrial dysfunction, and induce the beijing of adipose tissues. Adam Filippi, um, Sergey Korin, and Sergey Nurnk, along with a team of collaborators, provided insights into the evolution and variation of centromeres. The researchers generated a complete set of centromere sequences from a second human genome. The researchers also found notable variation in the number of certain types of DNA repeats. I'll pause here and say it was rather ironic because this same exact paper was independently selected by extramural staff to be one of the investigator-initiated highlights that I featured earlier in my director's report. So this, this paper really nicely illustrates a wonderful example of an intramural, extramural collaboration involving NHGRI-funded investigators in both programs. And finally, Larry Brody's group used a new mitochondrial genome sequencing method to study how diet, specifically the amount of vitamin B12 and folate, affects mutation rates. The researchers found that vitamin B12 deficiency increased the number of mutations in the mitochondrial genomes of the mice, and that this was especially true uh, for older mice. Uh, before I end my director's report, I should, as always, um, tell you that we work really hard to try to make sure we can stay um, updated, uh, or we keep you updated. And I have uh, a website that we've organized to provide a one-stop shop for staying connected with me and with the Institute. If you go and visit this URL, you come to this um, uh, page. But if you scroll down, you get a menu of other options that include everything from our website, biographies, various ways of, of reaching me on social media or through my monthly newsletter but other things about the Institute, including our strategic vision, our oral histories, our talking glossary, and so forth. But you can keep scrolling and get to other talks, of uh, recent talks of mine, as well as uh, podcasts and uh, pub uh, published uh, features as well. And we just try to keep this really well organized for people who want to sort of get to highlights of interest from the Institute and connecting to it. So I will stop there by thanking um, all the staff that helped pull together uh, these uh, 67, 68 slides that I just went through. Such a group effort, of course, is required if we're going to cover as much material efficiently at Council. I want to especially thank folks who uh, review the director's report at various stages um, along the way before it gets presented now, but also my Office of Communications for creating the electronic resource, including uh, getting the videotape posted on YouTube. And if we always have special thanks for what are now ring leaders who helped me prepare and really do the conducting of this grand orchestra that pulled this together. It now includes um, Vanessa Campos and Chris Wetterstrand. Uh, they're pictured here in eclipse gear in honor of the eclipse that occurred last month. So I will stop there and happy to take any questions if you have them. If not, we will move on. Any questions or comments? 
Iftikhar. Eric, you mentioned the FDA's plans to regulate LDTs. This has happened before. I mean, they've threatened to do this in the past. How do you foresee this particular time? How would it be different? I'll just start by I don't work for the FDA. Um, so I, the plan's detailed and is going to be phased. And as I understand it, I'm looking to see if my policy folks can back me up, is that most of the existing tests will be grandfathered. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to roll out. It's, uh, the, what they've done before is said we've always had the discretion to do enforcement. And so the difference this time is that they've set up a, um, a manual of what the regulations are supposed to look like. And so it will roll out over the next four years. And my guess is that there'll be, I know there'll be legal challenges. Um, and they'll have to see how it works. Kay Kayla, do you want to make a comment? Kayla from our policy group oh, is on Zoom. Yeah, hi, Larry. I'm online. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, this is the first uh, time the FDA has finalized a rule. So uh, it went it went in effect on May 6th, but it gets fully enforced in uh, on June 7th, I believe, or July 7th. I have to double check that. And so we have about two months to see legal action. But yes, we will see um, a lot of tests being grandfathered in. There are some stipulations around that. And there are also a lot of other uh, tests that are going to be exempt from this, like 1976 style tests, think immunohistochemistry style tests, um, tests for public public health purposes, law enforcement, uh, things like that. So there, it is definitely a little bit more refined than the proposed rule. And again, there's the four year phase out, um, but we'll see what will happen in the next few months with the potential for legal action. And then there's also a current Supreme Court case that could affect the outcome of this rule that we're tracking. Um, so a lot of things going on right now, but we should have a lot more a uh, clearer view of what's going on in the next two months. One just addendum is that the current tests would be grandfathered unless there were substantial changes to them. I take substantial as to be real fundamental changes, not just changing a machine or two. I guess the concern is um, stifling innovation in genetic testing going forward. Due to the expense, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think it would stifle innovation. It's just whether or not that innovation would be introduced in an easy fashion. So the costs associated with this are considerable, and the FDA has done this modeling. I, I hear sighs around the table. Yes. We, 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 we feel the same thing. And <laughs> One quick thing, Eric. Since uh, you featured Marty Recksteiner yes. prominently in your discussion, I have to note the irony that in the building next to Professor Recksteiner's lab, human geneticists were developing technologies like RFLP and later STR. They were, develop they were collecting the Ceph pedigrees. Um, so there were some spirited arguments in the hallways. And I think history has really decided the argument pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I will point out that um, I didn't mention this, but we've actually been reaching out to some of the letter writers and letting them know that. And um, uh, some of them, you know, it's been a long time. Some of them, sadly, are no longer with us. But some respond. And actually, some of them are actually quite engaging and, you know, sort of say, yeah, boy, you know, prove me wrong. Or, you know, yeah, that's really interesting. You know, they, they're actually, they're not, uh, they're not really negative. They're really actually quite interested to be contacted and sort of thought the whole thing is sort of interesting to watch. And so it's been fun to hear from some of them. Nancy. I would also note the, the sculptor of the ladder. Um, there, there's one at Vanderbilt. I don't, there may, and it was on the cover of one of the genetics textbooks. Yes, so that, that's not by accident. So this all happened because Vanderbilt um, invited Diana to give a talk, I don't know, maybe like eight years ago or something. And she walked through the court, and she loved it because it had babies on the double heroes. And so she said, who's the artist? And then she contacted the artist, and it turned out the artist had made two. And that started this long yeah. relationship that ultimately, that, I think all that started even before Diana came to NIH, yeah. and then resulted in the donation. So yeah, so the, it's the same exact sculpture that now exists at Vanderbilt. No, these the babies end. look much thinner. Ours are very muscular. I believe they <laughs> carry the mutation for the double muscling, um, unquestionably. They are really 
really we athletic we babies. Will, we, we can get them all tested. We'll, do, we'll sequence their genomes. How's that? Okay. okay. Yes, Judy. Yeah, this may be a premature suggestion, but I, this morphic is just beginning to get off the ground. But I'm just wondering if you might consider connecting uh, the morphic consortium in some type of way uh, with a mouse knockout project. Just something to think about down the line. Does anybody, I mean, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Does anybody want to make, uh, Carolyn, I had a feeling you might want to make a comment. Yeah, so Colin Fletcher is actually the program director on both of those programs, and we're already talking about the sustainability of the um, mouse knockout program and connect potential connections to Morphic. There's other directions that may go. We haven't actually done, I'm not, I don't want to misrepresent and say that we've fully done that yet, but that's certainly something that's on our, our horizon. Well, thank you for those questions, all good questions.